that our two speakers today are um, Deborah Flint, who's the president of the Greater Toronto Airport Authority, Airports Authority, there's two of them, and uh, Tamara, Tamara, Tamara. Tamara Vrooman, who's the head of the um, Vancouver Airport Authority. And we want to talk today a bit about where Canada's airports are at, and this is the theme of the summit, is a growth summit, so um, sort of situating airports in sort of a, a, a growth narrative. But I think um, to go back 15 years or so and think about Canada's airports, it looked, you know, a decade ago that Canada's airports were on quite a roll. I mean, we had seen some kind of spectacular developments of new airport infrastructure, terminals. I mean, I don't know anyone, a lot of public policy people here coming in and out of Ottawa Airport and how for um, most of our adult lives it was pretty much a disgrace and then they built this kind of wonderful airport terminal that sort of defines the country and the region that is kind of a, kind of a, a, a good calling card for people from around the world who land in Ottawa in a way that never existed before. But downside to that kind of scenario was that all of that development led to an incredible amount of capital investment in debt in Canada's airports. And uh, the pandemic struck and revenues went to zero. Um, the business model kind of had to needed a rethink um, because it's emphasis on passenger travel, on business passenger travel. And we don't know whether or not much of that is going to come back or to what extent it's going to come back. And then you've got all this infrastructure to pay for, but you not only have to pay for the built infrastructure you've built, you've got to maintain it. You've got to be thinking ahead of the, of the wired world in which we live, a wireless world in which we live, and how airports have to continually upgrade their capacity to service customers that are, are demanding in that respect. So, I guess I'd like to start with um, Deborah to ask you how you foresee and define the biggest changes from a post-pandemic airport business model, or sorry, a pre-pandemic business airport model to a post-pandemic airport model. Thank you. Thank you for that, Conrad. Good to see all of you here today. It's a pleasure to be here at the Public Policy Forum and greeting to my colleague and friend, uh, Tamaro, that's joining on the line as well. Uh, both of us joined relatively kind of within the pandemic window. I uh, uh, joined as the president and CEO of, of the GTAA a month before the pandemic struck. Wow. And uh, Tamara was on the board of Vancouver Authority. She was joining the organization and she and I got to have a relationship. And I was just so thankful that she didn't change her mind uh, since she joined, I think, within two quarters of the pandemic uh, being in full tilt. So, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll share my, my thoughts on, on your question about pre and within pandemic uh, uh, differences from kind of two perspectives, uh, the, the, the current problem state, but then also the, the future opportunities, which I think are really critical for us to, to be working on now. Um, you know, current problem state is uh, there's so much more friction in the process of the airport. Um, there's uh, so much more confusion. Uh, you know, we had some uh, inconsistencies, say post 9-11, and what you could carry through a checkpoint, what you couldn't, you know, were you on a no-fly list or something like that. Um, and the process was cumbersome, but it's nothing compared to what it is today, where health requirements, vaccine requirements, testing, possible quarantine requirements, all are um, very uh, fractionalized across, uh, you know, within countries. That happens, you know, even within our own country here in Canada and certainly across many of the G7 or even G20 countries as well. And so that uh, in a time when everything else has become smoother through technology and we're facing this great, you know, very significant disruption uh, as a sector, we've got to remove a lot of that friction. But it's also important that we learn now from what worked best, what doesn't work as effectively in a pandemic. Um, we've got to 
whether it's future variants, we hope not, or if it's years from now that there would be a, a future pandemic, it's imperative that we understand and, and get to some agreement that is science-based and with our health partners so that we have a series of tools in the playbook going forward that we all agree on can make sense. And we've got to, I think, you know, whether it's the aviation sector or, or practically any other business, uh, work more closely with health policymakers and health officials so that there is more understanding about the implications of, um, of health policy on society and business. And the ultimate goal of protecting every Canadian is absolutely the right one, but uh, we also have to have the right economy in order to achieve that goal as well. Okay. Tamara, did you just want to comment on uh, pre-pandemic versus post? Yeah, thanks very much, Conrad, and and hello to uh, to to my colleague, uh, great colleague Deborah, and uh, all of you in the audience. And of course, one of the biggest changes is exactly the medium in which I'm uh, presenting to you today. So uh, pre-pandemic, I would have been there in person because this option wouldn't have been available. Uh, Post-pandemic, clearly, business travel and the need to be in person for all business meetings is uh, is something that I think has changed permanently. Um, uh, and uh, therefore the business model of aviation where the front of the plane pays for the back of the plane uh, probably also is going to change going forward. But some of the things that are, are different uh, pre-pandemic than post-pandemic, as you correctly said, Conrad, you know, Canadian airports were making some tremendous investments in our passenger facilities, uh, in our sense of place, uh, in our ability, in our case, uh, YBR uh, named the best airport in North America for 12 years in a row, uh, the only airport to receive that designation. And that's really largely based on our passenger facilities. Before the pandemic, we had a huge and growing business from China. And uh, YBR, not certainly the biggest airport in the country, uh, let alone the biggest one on the continent, had more direct flights to China than any other uh, airport. Um, clearly, that is not going to be uh, part of our business model going forward. So we were very successful in focusing on the brand of Canada, on the brand of our region, on really developing at GTA, clearly, uh, um, uh, as well as YBR, world-class passenger facilities. I think what the pandemic has taught us is not only how we need to move people through in the way that Deborah talked about, but that the very nature of our business has probably permanently changed. So one of the things that really was a bright side during the pandemic was of course cargo, something we don't talk about uh, that much uh, as airports and something that the public doesn't think about uh, when they think about going through an airport. But a huge part of what Deborah's airport and Suf and mine have been uh, doing through the pandemic is fulfilling all of that e-commerce. Supply chains are changing. And so therefore our investment in cargo and uh, fulfillment also needs to change. You know, during the, uh, during the terrible atmospheric rivers and floods that we had here in British Columbia in late November, for 10 days, the only connection uh, part between the second largest metropolitan region and the rest of the country uh, was YBR. And so all of the emergency crews, all of the uh, cargo, emergency cargo that needed to go, that couldn't go because the roads were washed out and the rail was washed out, was uh, connected only uh, because of the fact that we stayed open for, uh, for those 10 days. So I think there's also a an awakening to the fact that airports are a vital part of moving people, but we're equally uh, vital in moving cargo. And that changes uh, the business model for carriers. You'll see Air Canada's launched a cargo uh, business, WestJet a cargo business, as well as uh, competition from uh, Amazon Air, now the biggest airline in the world by number of aircraft in only five short years. So the nature of our business is changing and therefore the investments that we make in the infrastructure needs to catch up that excellent infrastructure that you talked about that is world class on the passenger side needs to equally be met on the cargo and the logistics side if we're going to do our part and we have a huge role to play in the recovery and the rebuilding of supply chains. Um, as we think about the economic growth for the country. Great. Well, I mean, I believe I read somewhere that YVR is as, as a call to tender for a, a new 300,000 square foot cargo facility, I guess. Um, 
was wondering if you could give a breakdown, both of you, of, of if the business is changing, what is the breakdown between business travel, leisure travel, cargo, and how is that shifting from before to after the pandemic? And, and, and um, if it's shifting to cargo, are, are you, is it a growing pie or are you taking business away from another sector? Yeah, I, my, my view on cargo and, and airports is that they've never been mutually exclusive. Um, a significant amount of the cargo lift, particularly e-commerce, is taking place in the bellies of actual passenger aircraft. Uh, when there was not a lot of aircraft moving because of border shutdowns and the world was effectively closed, uh, those passenger aircraft were converted to what they called praters, right? So they were just taking the same passenger aircraft and redistributing those seats um, and filling them with containers instead. Um, and so, you know, a healthy uh, economy and a healthy airport, of course, will have all dedicated cargo flights and facilities. That's critically important. And it's especially important that we digitalize the cargo and logistics network in Canada uh, in order for that to be competitive. We need hard brick and mortar facilities that are automated, but we also need the paperwork and the process to be streamlined. It's, I, I think, at least 10 years behind some of the more modern uh, cargo chains. Um, but we, we will also continue to focus on the passenger experience as well, uh, because again, a, a passenger route that uh, uh, may be marginally working between two particular uh, uh, cities uh, can be very successful if the cargo is optimized uh, on that route as well. It could be the reason why various cities actually get service into Toronto is because of the cargo lift, either on an import or an export basis. Um, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, I, I like to see the challenges that, that motivates uh, me and my organization to, to rise to the challenge and to see around corners and to position ourselves for success. And uh, you know, I do think that uh, the return fully of business travel is, is, a, is a big challenge for the sector. Uh, just because of the ease of the disruption, uh, to make a day trip for a one or two hour meeting uh, if you are potentially at risk of taking a test that's going to ground you in a city and at a hotel for five, seven, or ten days, um, that, uh, that is a, a, a detractor to doing business travel for sure. Um, the ease of uh, the time utilization. Uh, well, I'm sure we'll talk about the transition to net zero, uh, but we know that there are corporations that are also using uh, air travel avoidance as a ways of demonstrating their uh, pathway to carbon neutrality. So, you know, I believe those are, are some significant threats against the industry from a business traveler perspective uh, that we've got to work through. Uh, and I'm very confident and bullish about the future of our industry to make meaningful headway and to take those challenges on. Uh, but that's the imperative today. Uh, our screening processes at the airport, uh, even, on, even as travel requirements and restrictions have eased, Today, to across the border, the air border into Toronto, it is four times as long per person with a border screening officer. What was 30 seconds transaction average before is now two minutes. And you multiply that, and then you also have uh, you know, the, the extreme situations where people just have none of their paperwork ready. They're still being handed physical paperwork. Uh, there's, uh, you know, your arrive can still has questions that the officers are verifying. When, when you add that into the process, you know, 10 years ago, TSA in the United States implemented risk-based screening. We don't, we screen everyone the same way, including myself, even with my security clearances. I'm screened like every other person. And so, you know, the idea that we should be focusing on the unknowns or individuals that present somewhat of a, a, a risk and, and allowing people that have been vetted ahead of time to ease through security is a way of just promoting efficiency. We've got to tackle those things in order to compete with the disruption and to, to get the business traveler uh, back. Because there's nothing, I still right. you know, portray that there's nothing like being in person uh, to get a deal done, to drive culture, uh, and, to bring, and to build just what we're, we're meant to see, I think, as humans. Right. Um, so, Tamara, if you could just quickly talk about the breakdown of business and then sort of build off um, Deborah's answer there that suggested that, I mean, there are some things we're not doing perhaps as efficiently as we could be doing in this country um, and that that's, um, you know, material issue for airports that are competing, not only to bring back business travel within the country from outside the country, but also 
um, to make sure that we're not losing traffic to uh, airports south of the border. Yeah, certainly the uh, the breakdown of uh, of cargo uh, to passengers um, has been a uh, cargo cargo has been strong um, certainly, but as uh, through the pandemic, but as Deborah said. The, uh, the bulk of cargo still goes in the belly of long haul in particular uh, passenger aircraft. So for example, we have uh, aircraft flying to China now that have uh, very few people, 10% maybe of the seats occupied, but they continue to fly because the, the belly is full of, uh, of cargo. So you don't get a clear picture when you see pre and post pandemic, but what you do see is a clear picture when we look at the relative economic value of passengers and particularly business passengers vis-a-vis -vis cargo. And so those, those planes are being reprofiled in terms of uh, seats because we see, and you'll see this if you book a flight yourself, more premium economy, less uh, full upfront business class as the model changes. But I think the exciting part is, uh, is the investments that we have made and we need to make. So during the pandemic, we built not a single building. In fact, we canceled a bunch of capital projects, but the major investment we did make was in digitizing our entire operation, right? Creating a full digital twin of the airport, both outside and inside, uh, so we can install sensors and uh, the internet, uh, IoT and AI capabilities in partnership with Bosch and Siemens and others around really taking a digital platform and putting it on top of an infrastructure platform. As Deborah says, our entire supply chain needs to be digitized in that way. It's better for passengers in our case, but it's also better for the movement of cargo. Through the pandemic, uh, other jurisdictions, notably in the United States, received literally hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in airport infrastructure to make these upgrades so they're ready to compete on both people and cargo in the reopening. We did not. And so we are in a competitive uh, disadvantage, frankly, and with so much of people and goods being so located so close to our border, the leakage of that business going south is a significant concern for our customers, and it should be a significant policy concern in terms of the competitive commercial infrastructure that's needed to support our recovery. Okay, well, that's a good segue into um, a couple of issues we want to tackle just before in the time we have left. So if we could do it as quickly as possible. The one is, I mean, you're talking to Ottawa these days. I mean, you, you have deferred rent these days from uh, the federal government. And I mean, what are the issues that are critical to your sector to ensure that you're, um, <laughs> you can make the investments that you need to make to remain competitive while at the same time tag of tag is, Ta tackling some of these legacy issues that are left over from the pandemic and uh, you know the whole structure of uh, the rent um, the rent payments that you would normally be making and how those have to be renegotiated going forward which what which one of you wants to tackle that uh, question I first? think we, we both have plenty to say because yeah. we talk about it amongst ourselves quite a bit um, so so I'll say look I you know you, you talked about the Canadian model first I actually think there's a lot of benefit in the current Canadian model and it's one of the reasons that I, I as a Canadian citizen I, I ran mostly US airports before this both Oakland and LAX um, and as the CEO there, this was a very interesting model for me to come to uh, because it, it incentivizes uh, growth, it incentivizes rapid change, it's not link held back a certain way for, for some political challenges that many airports in the United States will find that they have. That's why Tamara has uh, 12 years as, with an award for best airport, and Toronto also has five years running of uh, ACI's best airport in North America. Um, but, but there is the, the challenge that in a pandemic, um, every, there's no deal that was ever 100% done. We all had to renegotiate deals, right, because of the, the lack of business. We were down to 2% of volume during that time. And what we saw was that even with the different business models across the world, other G7, G20 countries came and supported with, um, with more infrastructure support, more messaging support to their sectors than we had here in Canada. So even in the last year, there's $20 billion 
of uh, airport infrastructure funding to the U.S. airports to be spent in four years, another five billion for air traffic modernization. Uh, yes, we have, uh, the first year rent was waived. Every year since then, it's been deferred. And even last year, as we closed our books with a $300 million loss, $100 million of that is rent. The Canadian government has benefited from $3 billion since the development of this model. They are a greatly rewarded shareholder from, this, from the Canadian aviation system, and that's Pearson. And so we've got to, I think, work creatively with the government. Number one, make the, the industry attractive. We've got to transition to net zero. Why can we not take the rent that we are still accruing and that is showing up as a liability, even if we avoid paying it um, from a cash liquidity perspective, but invest that into greening infrastructure or digitalization infrastructure? I'd much rather build a ton of fiber uh, versus concrete, and that can help to make the country more competitive. It's not just the U.S. airports we're concerned about. We were the seventh most connected airport in the world at Pearson. That's, that is a reflection of this country. That is a reflection of this country's capabilities and its ambitions, not just the front door, but I call it the curb appeal that, uh, that one experiences when you're connecting across Europe through Canada, maybe into the United States. And so it is uh, having fall now, fallen now to 10th, I'm very concerned that what was a competitive advantage from our airports could now be a drag or friction for all of the surrounding economy and business that has centered itself uh, around our airports, both in Toronto and Vancouver. Very quickly, Tamara, because I want to bring in a question from the audience, and we only have uh, five minutes left. So um, what are the rent issue, obviously, is number one on your issues of something you've got to settle before, because you also need to go to back to public markets to borrow probably, and so I think public markets are looking for you to have some kind of resolution on that issue. Um, so how, how big is that for you and what's your time yeah. frame for getting that done? Yeah, yeah, uh, again, I uh, agree with much of uh, what Deborah said, so I'll just add to it. You know, the number one thing that our bondholders ask of us is when we're gonna issue a green bond. So there is quite a bit of interest in the greening of aviation and airport infrastructure, and and we both have we have a commitment to net zero by 2030, and uh, GTA uh, has uh, something similar. But the model that we have in Canada that has worked great for 30 years uh, has been a user pay model, and so that means that the debt is retired by essentially the users, the passengers, and the uh, and the carriers of the airport. Those are significantly weakened. <clears throat> and significantly fewer. And so we do need other financial, in addition to rent relief, it's not enough. Rent is just a percentage of revenue. And so if your revenue is down, yes, you get rev rent forgiveness, but it doesn't exactly allow right, okay. the cash flow to repay debt. That's why we have uh, received approval from the Minister of Transport for a new land use plan that allows us to develop those lands that you talked about. We can do that in partnership. We can attract equity from large scale pension funds and other Canadian institutional investors to help build uh, infrastructure and revenue that surrounds the airport in order to start to augment uh, the repayment of that debt. Because if we're left solely with users, passengers, of which there's fewer and uh, not of a business variety paying for that, the model just doesn't work unless we're going to charge the fees uh, for passengers to be totally um, unsustainable in terms of our recovery and in terms of ordinary Canadians' ability to actually pay. Okay, so does that sort of answer the question from the audience here? Do you feel Canada's user pay model is due for a change to allow citizens to travel more freely? I mean, how do you respond to something like that? Well, I think that's, that's absolutely part of it, right? Some ingenuity and flexibility in the rules. And uh, it's been demonstrated that the government is absolutely willing to do that so that we can expand. Uh, airports are absolutely thinking differently about revenue diversification. Um, and I would say, you know, think of your airport and in, in, in here in Pearson, uh, you know, as an opportunity for experimentation and living labs. There is so much innovation uh, that is uh, created in this country and nearby. 
And this is a time, particularly the transition to net zero for experimentation. Uh, we have small cities that we run effectively at airports and, uh, and we can showcase those opportunities to the world and make sure that the Canadian economy is lifted up as a result. I mean, that's why we're the second largest employment zone in the country. And that's not, the, the downtown Toronto is first and the airport area is second. So there's tremendous opportunity, but we've got to make sure, my belief is that we've got to think very urgently, um, act urgently, think uh, uh, openly about different levels of partnership uh, that we can entertain to, to move the country forward. Do you have a target for like getting back to 50 million passengers? Like uh, you know, forecasting, I wish, you know, who, who out there knows how to forecast uh, th this future? Because I'm currently still running three scenarios for 2022, and I'll probably continue to run three scenarios just given volatility, right. whether it's the environment, geopolitics, recessionary climate, supply chain, and labor. All of these are, uh, you know, inputs that we consider in our forecast. But, but I do think that uh, rapid growth is a great problem to have, and it's one that we're having right now. And I expect this year we'll finish at 50% of 2019. And uh, we could possibly equal that uh, uh, close to 2019 next year or the year after. Great. Tamara, if we could just wrap up in the same uh, segment about how um, you see, maybe this is just too much forecasting, but how you see your airports 10 years from now in terms of um, are you working on scenarios where business travel is back or um, quite the opposite? Or, and how do you plan for, you know, in a 10-year scenario when you're making capital investments? But Tamara, if you want to start very quickly. Yeah, sure. Uh, we certainly, uh, 10 years from now, are, are very bullish on, uh, on our airport and the contribution that it makes uh, not only to the region but to the, the western part. Uh, of the country. You will see us investing far more in digitization and technology. You'll see us significantly reducing uh, uh, our emissions to ensure that, you know, fuel, we are a fossil fuel driven industry. Fuel is uh, often the, uh, and energy is the number one input into our business. So with a price on carbon coming, we can debate about how big it's gonna be, but it's gonna be there, I think. We need to make sure we're on the lower register of that cost uh, infrastructure rather on the, uh, than on the higher. And so that's the business rationale for doing it. There's obviously a planet and a social benefit as well. You'll see us, I think, uh, very, very uh, strongly connected to the supply chain. You'll see us reestablishing routes to markets that maybe we hadn't thought about before as we see the decentralization trend uh, continue uh, through where people work and that sort of laptop culture that, uh, that we've heard about. Those are high value employment jobs. We need to make sure that we connect them to their clients when they need to see them uh, face to face. So it's going to be uh, bigger than it is today. It's going to be far more digitized. It's going to be greener, uh, but it'll be equally as vibrant. It'll just look different than it did pre pandemic where we had a big emphasis on business travel and uh, passengers uh, and sense of place uh, over digitized interconnectivity and uh, flexibility. Great. Ditto, ditto, ditto. Uh, thank you, Tamara, for that alignment. Um, and you'd see we have friendly competition too. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but I would say in, addi in addition to that, you, you will also see us um, from a connectivity perspective be radically different 10 years from now. Uh, you know, we are here for creating great employment. There are 300,000 people that used to work in the airport employment zone and ensuring that those employees, whether they're still in some hybrid mode, but that opportunity for them to work effectively and particularly at the airport with the frontline jobs of more than 50,000 people. Um, and many of those people are like laborers, making sure that they can have great vibrant family lives because it's easy for them, swift, predictable and reliable for them to get to the airport and to work. And so ground connectivity, transportation, uh, first, lot, first mile, last mile solutions that I think are gonna be very innovative and, and interesting um, and speed across the region uh, into our AEZ is gonna be a, a step change, a significant change for us when I think about us from 10 years, in 10 years. Great, well there you go folks. There is your crash course in Canadian <laughs> Airports 101. Thank you to Tamara and thank you to Deborah and I'll hand it over.